and thank you to everyone for joining me for, for the talk this afternoon. Um, today we're going to be talking about how to allow your technical writers to do what they do best and what steps you can do to help automate uh, mundane tasks for them. Um, and thus the title, Let Writers Write, Automating the Boring Stuff for Adoxy. So I'm hopeful that you're going to get some inspiration and thoughts on what you can do in your own work, things that you can take home from this. And uh, yeah, I'm really excited to share some of our experiences with you. So first, a little backstory on myself and the company where I work, Adyen, uh, just so you know who you're talking to. This is me, uh, Patrick Hammond. I've worked as a technical writer um, in Adyen for five years. Uh, previous to that, I worked at uh, VCE. I've worked as a developer, now I'm working as a project manager here at Adyen. Uh, Yes, as I say, I, I moved from Ireland to Harlem in a, a whirlwind decision. Uh, essentially, I decided Adyen was really cool and I wanted to work there. Um, my job nowadays is just enable doc ops and uh, helping maintain the quality of our documentation. And also, I'm a dog owner. I own a really cool dog. Uh, I make music and uh, write comics. And as I say, you possibly can tell by the red beard and you know, the general appearance of being great crack, but I am, in fact, Irish. So. And the accent. On to Adyen. Uh, there's an immense backstory here. We were founded in uh, 2006 in Amsterdam, went on to become a unicorn payment service provider. This means that when you pay for something through an app or a website, uh, it's quite likely that you've used us. We help uh, companies like Spotify, eBay, and a host of others to accept payments in a singular system across all of their sales channels. Uh, so the view there is from the top of our office which I have not seen since March, unfortunately, because of coronavirus. So I want to explain a bit about the journey we took to adopt DocOps before we talk code sample generation. Um, the hope is to give you a bit of context on the team setup and uh, how we do things. So let's go back to the past. The year is 2017. We've all declared naively that 2016 was the worst year ever and Alexei Akimov and I went to write the docs in Prague. There we are in the crowd. I'm on the left, he's on the right. My face is being blocked by a guy. Uh, <laughs> I feel like we really bad luck for blocking people's faces in photos at write the docs at Adyen. Uh, anyway, back then we were a team of uh, three writers working with a very popular wiki-like software um, and we weren't crazy about it. So it was at this conference that we first began to talk about moving to Docs as code or doc ops, in essence, some kind of better way of doing things. So while we weren't clear on what was out there or what we wanted, we knew what we hated, which is always a, a prime motivator to get things started. So first off, plugins and the ability to control things. There was plugins all over the place. If you want to separate life from staging, get a plugin. If you want to embed videos, get a plugin. If you want to do testing, plugin. If you want to publish, plugin. Uh, everything was a black box. If a plugin didn't do something you wanted it to do, there was no way to fix it. Also, the docs were being stored in a database in a proprietary format, which, which made it difficult to work with for automation and that kind of thing. Um, if you wanted a front end, guess what? Another plugin. Uh, it made it really difficult to attract the kind of talent who want to work with modern front end technologies and frameworks. Uh, then moving on to collaboration, yeah, it was quite expensive to get access for everyone, uh, allowing them to do things like comment on the docs and suggest changes. It would have required, you're, you're never going to guess this, more plugins. So let's look now to where we are at today. Here's the team of lovely people that I get to work with every day. Uh, we have people from all kinds of disciplines, backgrounds, working as technical writers, developers, product designers, team leads, product owners, and yes, even a humble project manager named Patrick. And the documentation set that we work with, which is lots and lots of pages, including reuse pages that are peppered throughout our docs. Uh, the documentation is targeted at different levels of expertise. We try to use our internal style guides to deliver all of it with, with one voice. So what are we using nowadays? Well, we store all of our docs in Markdown um, in Git, and uh, we enable collaboration from other teams outside using a suggestion feature we built in-house. Um, we work closely with the CMS developers to ensure that we've got a useful editor. Uh, but uh, our writers also have the option to work in IDs should they choose. And finally, we write tools to try to ensure that our docs aren't full of issues. And uh, a lot of how we got there was by adopting a doc ops approach. So that's kind of the focus of what I do. 
So our goal that day in 2017 was to create a content flow that allowed for collaboration, uh, a process that would allow us to easily keep pace with the development cycles and even allow uh, for out of cycle updates where required. So to be released on a continuous basis and would enable reuse. When we set up the CMS and the docs as code flow and some other items, we were moving toward a doc ops approach, but we established doc ops group to continue on and develop tools and processes to go even further, uh, which is, by the way, buy-in to documentation on a level I didn't know existed previously. This is our little group within a group. There's me, I'm the project manager, as I say, with a twist of engineer and architect. There's Tyne, who works as our uh, engineer and general buff, and Jan, who uh, recently joined us as a university student assisting us with the project. So we've created a culture that serves documentation in a way that understands how tech writers work. Um, and yeah, I've, I've, I'll take this opportunity actually to thank both of these people. Tyne, who's been involved from the project from the start, he's been an invaluable source of Python knowledge when my skills fail me. And yeah, both, both lads are very easy to work with. Speaking of Python, here are the technologies we use. I was never a, a Python programmer before this project, having a background in Java, C Sharp, and general messing Bash, C, some other stuff. Um, so over the course of the last year or two, I've become very familiar with the language. And uh, yeah, I love it. I think it's great. So I know that there will be people out there who think another language is a better option for automation, and perhaps, but Python was, and doing things in, in a Pythonic way has really helped us create uh, robust stuff. We're using libraries, of course, uh, like Pandas and a bunch of others. Uh, Jenkins is where we run all of this stuff. So similarly, getting familiar with pipelines and building jobs was a must. And finally, we use Git not only to, to store our stuff, but often in the process of uh, running a pipeline. So as far as the Doc Ops project I run, uh, as I say, it's all about keeping the docs flowing. Uh, so first off, uh, our publishing flow in Jenkins, how we merge and test and push live. Uh, then content integrity checks performed by our uh, content checker, an OP system that we built for testing to make sure there's no unexpected problems in our docs. Uh, there are numerous things we define as problems, like missing images, alt text, uh, document elements. This also includes checking for broken links in our documentation and linting, uh, which speaking of linting, there, we're working on some really cool stuff there, but uh, it's kind of for another talk. So we'll do that another time. And finally, we've developed a code sample generation and testing, which brings us neatly to the meat of today's talk, the code samples in our docs. To be like, perfectly clear here, we're, we're talking about uh, code snippets included in our documentation, for examples, and uh, not, not API samples generated with Swagger or anything like that. So these samples tend to be smaller and they're tend to be lots of them. Uh, they're all pretty similar to each other. So updating them can be really frustrating for technical writers. We're documenting custom libraries. So it's not generic stuff, meaning we, we had to build something custom. We can't just do an auto translate from uh, curl or, or what have you. And we had no way to test the samples to make sure that they actually work. Janitors, a noble job. Where you work, where you travel, uh, every building you enter and exit, actually, there is a janitor somewhere there cleaning and maintaining the place. It's important job in the physical world. They keep everything tidy, ready to go, flag things that need an external fix, that kind of thing. And of course, they're not technical writers. Uh, it's a totally different skill set and mindset. Technical writers, they are not janitors, shockingly enough. They want to be able to spend more time uh, writing instead of having to deal with loads of supplemental tasks that aren't necessarily pushing forward the docs. They don't want to have to manage hundreds of different uh, yeah, different files that, that basically say the same thing, uh, especially given that they may or may not be a programmer. They may have varying levels of familiarity with different programming languages. So the idea was that we create a tool that could help avoid turning technical writers into genders. Again, exemplifying the ideas of Doc Ops, allowing for easy collaboration, easier reuse, prevent any barriers to keeping up with the development's process. The requirements gathered for the tool would that it would be allowing a single point of update, uh, technically in multiple CSVs, but stored in one place. Uh, the ability to include variables within the samples that are defined on page, the ability to generate these automatically from Jenkins, a uh, quick process for changing and generating new code samples, 
and uh, be able to host the final code samples in one place, i.e. from reuse and RDAX. Not to say that there weren't challenges that we would face. So and nobody said it was easy as a line from a cold play song. I stuck that in there on purpose. So first off, it needed to be easier to use than the current setup and be convenient. No one is going to use it if it's more difficult. Uh, and if nobody wants to use it, then it's all pretty pointless. Secondly, identifying the areas that should be part of program log logic versus what should be in the control of the writer, for example. There, there's always a split in the zone of control there, and defining that separation isn't always clear or easy. And finally, testing with so many languages involved, the seven different languages, PHP, Java, JavaScript, Python, Go, C Sharp, and Ruby, and multiple environments, so web, Android, iOS, uh, and straight API, direct API, as well as uh, multiple integration types per environment, then we have our own libraries dropping in components. So it would make testing all of these samples a real challenge. Uh, which leads us to the main challenge, uh, the sheer amount of data that we're dealing with. It was clear that there was going to be a, a lot of upfront manual analysis in setting up the automation. I could write tools to do some of this for me, but it was if it was a once-only kind of task, it was hard to justify the development time versus just figuring it out by looking through the samples. So this led me to eventually feeling like everything was a code sample. So it was a little bit like Neo in the Matrix in that famous scene you see on the right there where he's staring at a people made out of data. Uh, to say it was kind of overwhelming is, is an understatement. But uh, it, yeah, it, it was important that I use a structure to guide the process of building the tool for that reason. So how did it work? What were the stages involved? First off, uh, we went through the current code samples, figured out what was common to all the samples and where they were different. Uh, doing this took a while, but it meant that I became quite familiar with the stuff, which would be useful later on. In doing so, we realized some things. The, the samples weren't inconsistent per language, despite the fact that they were doing the same thing normally. Sometimes this was down to language differences. Other times, it was just different developers doing different things in different ways. Uh, between integrations, we were doing things differently that were not determined by integration. Again, inconsistency probably just introduced to different developers, different teams being involved. Uh, changes had been introduced to some samples, but not to others. This meant that there uh, were some that were up to date more than others. Um, people had noticed like a problem in one sample, uh, but because of the lack of reuse, this wasn't then reflected in other samples. Uh, there was a lack of awareness of these problems across the team due to the sheer volume of data involved. Again, that matrix picture, it's very difficult to keep that much stuff consistent. But the good news, of course, was that there was absolutely buckets of scope for consolidation, uh, changing many samples into fewer. And because of a, a lot of potential consistency, it seemed like automation would definitely be possible. So uh, from here, the next step was to gain agreement before beginning the process of automation on what existed and uh, the improvements we wanted to make to the code samples up front. This included addressing inaccuracies or inconsistencies that looked to be mistakes. So making changes midway through the process of automating uh, the generation of these code samples should be avoided if possible because yeah, you're, you're halfway through a really difficult process of actually taking all of these chunks and, and, and automating them and then suddenly someone changes something, you, you don't want it. So a breakdown. Well, this might indeed describe my state when I was first feeling overwhelmed by the level of task ahead of me. Uh, it in fact refers to the need to break down the code samples into chunks identify boilerplate items that apply to everything and separate them. So you're looking for patterns where possible and, and you want to find commonalities between languages and structures within the languages. So you'll be hosting these chunks somewhere technical writers can easily edit them. Uh, in our case, we chose a CSV file. And after all the chunks have been defined and separated, you're going to need some kind of logic to bring them all back together in the right order automatically. In our case, this meant loading chunks from the CSV and ordering and writing them to a file. Yeah, and finally, launching fast. So at Adyen, we have something called our Adyen formula, which are kind of uh, guiding principles behind the company. And one of these principles is that we launch fast and we iterate on it. Getting version one out there is uh, more important than having everything completed at the start. So this allowed us to work with the writers and library developers to improve process uh, efficiency and, and perform user acceptance testing with our uh, main users, the technical writers, uh, just to see you know, if they actually like this thing. 
So note, I am no diagram expert or a designer. Uh, I did my best to make a simple diagram to demonstrate this for you, but please don't judge me too harshly for my lack of design skill. Uh, first off, the generator, it, it goes off and pulls some predefined bash files that include endpoint names. Uh, we used to reference other values in there, but it was a bit pointless in the end because the, you know, the samples just include so much other stuff. Um, it pulls the chunks of code that I mentioned that are defined in those CSVs. It loads these chunks into local variables. It's doing some stuff under the hood to, to reduce repetition. Depending on the endpoint or integration that it's currently working on, it may override variables with values provided from other CSV files. Then it orders the chunks. This is important because depending on the language, uh, equivalent chunks might not be in the same place. And finally, it outputs these files uh, with an extension denoting the language. And here is the tech writer flow, so how they interact with the tool. Uh, firstly, the tech writers will edit a CSV. If they need to find something, they can pretty easily search and quickly update it. Uh, changing and removing values is easy, but adding values is currently in our domain of control. Uh, we're moving to a more dynamic setup in the future. The tech writer pushes their updated CSV to Git. This automatically kicks off the code sample generator in Jenkins using Webhook. And this builds the code samples and pushes them to a repository uh, where the content of the files is shared to our docs in the reuse section. So our results. Um, so we can say that we, we've improved the samples and created an easier process for tech writers. Uh, we consolidated the samples first of all. So we removed things that were different between samples across languages, integration types, and environments. Uh, there's a single point of update now. So tech writers make updates in one place. They make changes to the CSV, and we generate the samples from that uh, versus making changes in all of the different files. And we store all of the samples in one place and in reuse shared throughout the docs. So 140 plus samples became 35, reused with uh, conditional reuse and variable reuse, depending on the integration or the environment, we can set that on the page. So some quotes. <laughs> so first off, uh, Andrea S, uh, one of our newer technical writers, uh, she said, I'm loving this automated code block feature. And uh, yeah, this was right when we kind of went live with it. It was one of the first bits of feedback that we got on it. It was uh, really great. Second off, uh, Paula, who was performing user acceptance testing for us, uh, the generation went beautifully. Um, I can tell you when I saw beautifully rather than terribly, I was like, yes, thank God. So uh, I want to make a, a special note here to say it's it's really easy working with these writers. They're, they're really good at giving feedback on what they like and what they don't like. Um, so yeah, thank you folks for, for helping me build this tool and helping me continue to improve it. And finally, the most important quote, oh, hey, this is actually pretty cool, said almost every developer who was interviewed um, with a degree of uh, suspicion in their eyes, like, why is this so cool? Uh, so now an overview of what remains to be done, where we want to take this. So there are always things that we can do to improve on what we have. I think it's a maximum of documentation that you are never done. Uh, automated testing. So currently, we just run the examples in a local environment manually, um, which is good enough to test once and, and put them out there, but not really sustainable as the samples change more over time. Our developers saw the tool I was doing that with. And as I say, they, they, they thought all of this was cool. So they suggested that they could integrate the samples into their own testing environment somewhere. Um, so we're looking into doing that now. Uh, further testing, there are more integrations we need to automate that have a similar setup in, in how they're defined. So other parts of our documentation, like uh, we have tokenization uh, feature, for example, which will use the same thing. And yeah, of course, the code can always be improved. I'm certainly not perfect. Uh, we can make the tool more dynamic. We can allow for more technical writer control, like adding new chunks on the fly, controlling order. And uh, there's yeah redundancies that can be reduced in what we're doing currently. So I reckon we have time to do this. I wasn't sure if we would, but uh, if there's no objections, I want to show what this actually looks like. So here's what a CSV looks like. Uh, this is for our web uh, code samples. So you can see all these different chunks in here. Some of them are probably repeated, hence redundancies, but for the most part, they're not. Uh, we're doing a lot of replacing as well. You can see these guys here. There's a lot of uh, variables that we're actually replacing at runtime and they're defined in these uh, sections up here, these variables. 
So from a decorator perspective, if they want to update something, they're just looking for the existing thing in here. Let's say the we change merchant account to really cool merchant account. Well, they're just updating that. Um, from there, uh, let's look at if I can open my bar here. <laughs> okay, sorry, there's a little thing popping up at the bottom that made it difficult to click on it. Uh, so I'm just going to walk you through the iterator here that we have. It's pretty high level because to go into detail on all this stuff would kind of uh, either bore you to death or take ages, one or the other. Um, so first off, we are doing the code selecting. So that's pulling all of the CSV chunks from the uh, CS, uh, from the CSV, funnily enough, that I just showed you. How uh, we modify those chunks. So we have a class called Code Builder here that's doing that. And then we output all that stuff to a file. So that's this guy here. Um, and you can see some of the logic here, like depending on the environment type, it's setting that environment type and then building a whole bunch of samples. So this is our input. I tried this earlier on. This is our output. It's empty now. Let's cross our fingers. I'm expecting something to go wrong because this is life. No, oh, cool. So here you can see the end samples. So we have three different types of requests, payments requests, methods requests, details requests. Uh, and they're all in these different languages, all pulled from chunks. OK, let me go back to this Prezo. All right, uh, wrong one. Here we go. OK, that's all good, says you. What can I do? And uh, I'd like to leave you with some takeaways, because sometimes when I watch talks, I'm wondering, OK, uh, <laughs> that's great. What can I actually do with this? So it all kind of depends on your team setup, like what your areas of expertise are, who's on the team, what the makeup of it is. But these are just general actions I would recommend. First off, uh, you got to get buy-in from the business. Sorry, this is the wrong way around. First off, don't force your writers to be janitors. You want to leave as much of the manual testing done in review as possible. And second off, you want to get buy-in from the business. So if the powers that be at your business don't value documentation, it's always going to be an uphill battle. You're going to have to show that the benefits to writers and users translates into value for the business. Uh, thirdly, you got to look for repetitive tasks. So this is the meat of what you're going to be doing. Things that are done manually over and over again, especially tasks that impact the documentation flow or the overall quality of the documentation. That's the kind of stuff that you're looking for. And then you want to automate those tasks. That's easier said than done, uh, but it, it might involve getting a dedicated developer in the team. The kind of developer you want is someone who understands documentation and actually understands the use case of technical writers, which, yeah, it's a very, very, very specific use case. So thank you for listening to me today. I hope I've given you a decent overview of how we uh, how we facilitate doc apps, allow our tech writers uh, the freedom to write. And uh, hopefully you can take away some ideas and uh, inspiration that you can put to work in your own docs. <laughs>